Good. All right, we're going to try this out. Um, one thing that can be very helpful is as I keep working on these, uh, if you give me feedback on what could be more helpful, um, if I'm difficult to hear or the text is difficult to read, uh, that can be helpful if I know that as we progress throughout the year. If I'm trying to rely on this type of lesson, uh, a recorded lesson, uh, I got to make sure it's actually useful for you. So if you can let me know, that could be very helpful. So where we're going to start this week is the introduction into the fundamental concept of this class, which is rhetoric. <clears throat> it's really the, again, the fundamental or foundational concept that drives uh, practically all the work that we have in the class. These concepts are what will help you analyze and evaluate and break down the different things that we read to understand things like uh, rhetorical devices, rhetorical strategies, and of course, author's purpose, uh, the broader message or theme for everything that we read and really everything that you come across in life, okay? Rhetoric is kind of like the force from Star Wars where it's just, it's part of everything. It connects everything, it relates everything. It's always there, you may not know it's there, you may not feel it or sense it. But if you could be my Padawan for this school year, I will try to help you master your sense of rhetoric and how it really affects us uh, and how we encounter it in our life, okay? So an initial question, right? An initial concept to kind of break you into uh, how this works, okay? If you have money, how can I get it from you, right? How can I go about giving, uh, getting from you this thing that you love, the things that we put hours into our life for? How can I make you give that up, right? Obviously, I could offer you the essentials, right? I could try to offer food, clothing, shelter, uh, those essentials for survival, the things you have to, and those are usually the things we're most willing to give up our money for, right? Food, clothing, shelter. But what if there's something more? What if I have something completely useless that you don't need for survival, that is not essential in your life, but I've just got this dumb thing and I wanna make you give me money for it? How do I manipulate you? And right, that's really the kind of the basic concept of rhetoric. It's how you are manipulated, how, you, how your mind, your heart, your ego, your sense of self are all kind of manipulated and you get played like a puppet to get you to do what they want, okay? Again, oftentimes we think human beings that were so superior, right? Hey, we walk upright. Hey, we use tools. Hey, we drive cars. We build houses. We're not like those... Uh, dumb animals that just live outside, right? But then we forget there are still aspects of our nature uh, that allow us to be so easily manipulated, right? Um, <clears throat> aspects of our language, of our need to uh, develop relationships, the emotions that we have are all the strings that can control us, right? By some masterful puppeteer. Um, one thing, again, to keep in mind, okay, and this is what one thing we keep coming back to, uh, these concepts that we're going to talk about in rhetoric are nothing new. Okay? They are nothing new. Uh, the words for it are an invention. Hold on, I need to change something. There we go. Okay, the words for what we have are invention, but the concepts are fundamental and basic to who we are. Okay, So part of what we have to be able to work on in this class is recognizing the concepts of rhetoric and persuasion, but then also, of course, getting more comfortable in using the language and the vocabulary of rhetorical analysis, okay? So let me give you an example of this question of something that's completely useless, but I want your money, okay? So, <clears throat> how much would you pay for a plain white t-shirt, right? Just a plain white cotton t-shirt, right? Nothing fancy, okay? So maybe three to five dollars, right? Maybe five, ten dollars. Would you pay, let's see if I can get this right, $120 for a hip hop t-shirt, right? This thing, normally, I'm probably cheap to make. It's probably just, uh, hey, look at that. Yeah, it's 100% cotton. It says it's Egyptian cotton. 
if you trust that, right? If you know what that is. But here's the question. This thing that you would normally pay 3 to $5 for, okay? How can you get persuaded to spend $120 on it, right? And so the question comes down to the question of rhetoric, right? You attach a certain person's name on it and you're like, oh my gosh, now I'm tricked into thinking I have to pay this money, right? I'm going to give up my money because of who it is, right? And as we start getting into it, that's a concept of ethos, okay? Using the reputation of the person, uh, the identity of the person to pull in those strings in your brain, okay? Another example. If I could, whew, sorry, slides, fun, okay? Food, okay? If you look at an item of food, uh, 600 calories, right? 34 grams of fat <laughs> in one food item, half what you need for fat for the day, right? Basically half you need for your salt for the day. Uh, fiber, not a lot of fiber. Mm -mm. I mean, a pretty good amount of protein. Not bad, 24 grams, okay? <clears throat> if this was simply logos, right? If this was simply based on the facts, right? If it was simply based on the facts, no one in their right mind would ever spend money on this food because it's not food, right? But because we have that other aspect of who we are, right? We are not just driven by logos. We also have this emotion like the need to taste things that are yummy, okay? That kind of drives or overrides uh, our brain to make us focus on things other than logos, okay? And so using this as an example, right? Statistically, fundamentally, no one in their right mind would be eating at McDonald's, okay? And yet we do, right? Every week, every day, billions of people, we do. Why? Just because we're human, right? And that's the thing to remember. These things, ethos, pathos, and logos, they are fundamental to who we are. So if we're looking at this concept of rhetoric, Right, this rhetorical situation, and that's going to be one of the terms that I keep coming back to, rhetorical situation, where you have the interaction of ethos, pathos, and logos, right? How they interact, they never exist on their own, okay? They're always in some form of interaction, okay? So persuasion, how you are persuaded to do something, is based on how they interact, based on who the person is, right? Who the person is, how they make you feel, and then again, what they are saying. Who the person is, how they make you feel, and what they are saying. The classic representation of this is using a triangle, right? So we have these three points, ethos, logos, and pathos, right? And then how they combine together is what creates persuasion. That's what creates this motivation or this push to make you do something. Okay, let me give another an analogy, okay? It's kind of like fire, right? Um, to create fire, right, you need three different components, some sort of oxygen or oxidizing agent, you need heat, and you need some sort of fuel to combine those together. Separately, right, they're just the thing. They're just their own thing. But then when you combine them together, they create something entirely different, right? They create this entirely different outcome. And that's what rhetoric achieves, right? It creates this different effect, this different product, this different outcome based on how those are combined together, okay? And again, similarly to fire, adjusting what those different parts are. If you adjust the oxygen or the heat or the fuel, it changes what the fire is. It changes the nature of the fire. So when we look back at rhetoric, okay, we want to understand how each one is used in their own way, okay? How is ethos used in this situation? How is pathos used in this situation? And then logos in that situation, because each one is different. Not every speech is done the same way. Audiences are different. Speakers are different. Message is different, right? And that's what really these three relate to, okay? Speaker audience, and message. Each time they are different. Each time they are different. Okay, so if we, let's go back to some history, right? Let's go back to some history. That was me going back in time. I don't know why. <clears throat> All right, so if we, 
understand rhetoric, okay? All the Greeks did. They did not invent rhetoric, right? It's kind of like how they did not invent uh, calculus. No, they didn't invent calculus. That was later. But they did not invent, let's say, geometry, right? We all love geometry. Uh, Euclid sat down and, like, figured out, hey, look, there's squares and areas and pi r squared and 2 pi r and all that fun stuff that we love to learn about. It's not like Euclid invented geometry. Okay? He discovered the rules and the formulas and the ideas of geometry. Same thing with rhetoric. Okay? So that's why, again, rhetoric is this basic concept that we try to understand. Um, and it's, you can learn it without knowing anything about the ancient Greeks. Right? Um, it does kind of help us uh, get into the concepts better when you figure out how things work how things work and some of the explanations of how things work. Um, but again, this is just some of the basic overview, right? If we think of ancient Greece, I'm going to just kind of skip over the history real quick. I'll be getting into a lot more history later. Okay. So let me, again, one quick comment about uh, ethos, pathos, logos. And again, getting in this concept of Actually, I think I'm going to move things around. Okay. Hold on one sec. Ba, ba. Ah, okay. Um, so understanding rhetoric as a concept, okay, it is an art of persuasion. Okay, it is an art of persuasion. It's not an exact science. How you persuade somebody to do something, it's different depending on who the speaker is, who the um, audience is, and again, who the message is. It changes every time. You change who the speaker is, you have to have a completely different rhetorical situation, okay? So it's not an absolute science for how you persuade people or how a speaker can be persuasive. Um, and again, thinking of the speaker, it depends on who the speaker is, how persuasive they are, right? So if you think of some Instagram influencer, right, that tries to sell a product, okay, they are only influencing people that actually care about them, right? So if uh, Miss Kardashian West wants to sell some sort of, what is this vitamin thing that she's selling, right? The only people that are going to care about, care about it are people that actually follow her and care about what she says, right? If you're not part of that audience, her persuasion is not going to work on you, right? So again, if we're thinking of how, who the speaker is, um, what sort of reaction she wants out of, out of the audience and what her message is, okay? Things like social media or social media influencers, as an example, they only work on a certain audience, okay? If you are not in that audience, it will not persuade you, okay? So again, think of how each generation, there's different people that are popular or relevant or celebrities. Once their star starts to fade and they're not popular or relevant anymore, they don't really have any influence, Okay, so again, that question of how much longer will Kim Kardashian be relevant and be able to influence people? Hopefully not too much longer. Okay. Again, going back to understanding, again, this concept that you need to think of as rhetoric is this like active uh, mix of ingredients that are alive, okay, that change, okay? We are not always controlled by logos. We are not always controlled by pathos or ethos. It changes depends on depending on the situation. Okay. Um, let's see. Where do I want to go next? I know where I want to go next. Okay. So again, if we're thinking of the art of persuasion, okay, it comes out of our human nature, who we are as people. We have this need for identity and relationships, and looking at people's reputation. Okay. That is just one fund fundamental part of what it means to be human. We have a need to feel emotions. Okay? We are not robots. We are not Vulcan. We need emotions. They are part of our lives. And we have an ability to think. Right? So again, that's part of what drives rhetoric to be so persuasive. Using identity, using emotions, using our ability to think, we can be manipulated and pushed to a certain outcome. Okay? So again, you're always thinking about everything we do in this class everything you do that you, you read, you listen to, you consume, you need to be thinking, how is the speaker trying to manipulate you? Okay? And one of the most important parts of this is just having that awareness, right? Having that awareness of how the person speaking to you is trying to use that human nature, 
right? How they try to use that human nature to manipulate you to their own ends, right? And again, it can be tricky, okay? This is why we have problems with, this is where I want to get to it, okay? Problems with conspiracy theories, okay? Human beings are complicated creatures. We are and we are not, sort of paradoxically. So we have all these different things that go on. Why would anyone believe in this, this flat earth theory or the QAnon theory or the anti-vax theory, right? It's because we are not solely logical people. Just a heads up, they are going to be testing the fire control system this afternoon and morning. So if it does go off, please don't even. You know, it feels like your national chance blast. It won't go off, but just in case you they are testing the fire. little announcements. Just... Remember those? They're still fun. They're still fun. So again, the idea uh, and the example of conspiracy theories, right, is again to help you understand that we are a mix of ethos, pathos, and logos, right? We're a mix of ethos, pathos, and logos because we are not purely logical creatures, okay? Again, if we were purely logical creatures, there would be no flat earth theory. There would be no QAnon. There would be no anti-vaxxers, right? Because if you could be looking at what is logical and scientific and true instead of how you feel, instead of being driven uh, to belong to something, right? The need to belong to something, <clears throat> if we, if our focus was the truth, simply logos, right? There would be no such conspiracy theories, right? We could all live in harmony. But the, again, the difficulty is knowing that we have this human nature. We just need to know how it affects us, right? How it is used. And that's really sort of the biggest uh, goal or outcome, right? Being able to see how it is used and how these different people pieces can manipulate people or control people or persuade people, right? Okay, time for our first quick video. Walk on stage, walk on stage, walk on stage, walk on stage. I am a thought leader. You know that I'm a thought leader because I'm wearing a blazer, I have glasses, and I've just done this with my hands. I will now walk over to my laptop. By doing so, I'm demonstrating to you that as a thought leader, I understand technology and that there will be slides. Because everybody knows that a presentation seems more legitimate than it actually is if there are slides. I'm now going to come back to the center of the stage and give you some unremarkable context about how I became a thought leader. If it's okay with you, I'd like to pace while telling you this story. In 2009, I met a thought leader, and I asked him, how did you become a thought leader? And you know what he said? He said, I don't know. Now, that doesn't sound important, and it's not. But if I repeat it three times, I'm making you believe that it is important. He said, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know. Let's look at a picture of the planet for no reason. It's nice, isn't it? That's where we live. What happens if I put some words over it? Hmm. How about a number? What if I pose a question? By doing this, I've now made you think that I know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> Walking over here, I'm going to change the tone of my voice. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you an unremarkable story that's seemingly unrelated. <laughs> and it's funny. And <laughs> you'll know it's funny because I'm laughing. <laughs> and you're laughing. <laughs> and you'll ask yourself, what does this have to do with his talk? What is the point? <laughs> well, coming back to the center and slowing my speech, lowering the volume of my voice by looking at you directly and by making a list on my fingers I've made you believe there is a point. 
sip of water. Check the time. Ooh, let's bring this puppy home. Graph, 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 pie chart, statistic. How about we end with a question, a very big question. What if everybody in this room decided to come together and agree with what I'm saying? It's like a picture of the planet again. That is a world I want to live in. Coming back to the center of the stage, standing ovation. Humble head nod, humble head nod, humble head nod. See someone I know, humble head nod. Video fades to black while the applause continues for an unrealistic amount of time. Humble head nod. Thank you. Walk off screen. Walk off screen. Walk off screen. <laughs> Man, I love that video. So the idea, again, behind it is the video is kind of satirically, sarcastically narrating what's in the background, like what's in the back of the speaker's heads, how things are organized, to try to you know, be persuasive. If you ever watch any TED Talks, they are so manufactured, right, as much as a Big Mac is manufactured, to try to forced down the throats of the audience what the person's idea is. They're very entertaining, right? And that's kind of one way that they try to be persuasive, right? Just simple entertainment. Make it enjoyable. Make it have lots of flashy lights and stuff. Okay? <clears throat> and then the trick is, right, as you are analyzing something, right, you are no longer an audience. You are not allowed to be an audience, okay? You are an analyst, okay? <clears throat> you are a critical thinker. Where everything you see, you are no longer thinking about the stuff on the surface, right? And that's kind of what that, uh, the thought leader video shows. It shows you everything that's below the surface that you don't normally think about because we are so stuck on just thinking of what's above the surface, okay? <clears throat> and if this is you and you're trying to go through life just thinking about what's on the surface, you're going to end up like the Titanic and crash and burn and die because you just never noticed this was a huge iceberg, right? Not really. I'm kind of being hyperbolic there. <clears throat> but really, as you're going through, sailing on the waves with your analysis and thinking about stuff, your little ship needs to consider not just what you see, but what else is going on beneath it, right? So for rhetoric, it's where we get those three things, right? Ethos, pathos, and logos. The first thing, again, to understand is all about ethos, right? Ethos relies on and refers to who the person speaking is. Right? In this case, it's me, the ethos. In a speech, it's whoever the speaker is. It could be in a commercial, it could be the company. Not just who is in the ad, but who creates the company or who creates the commercial. Excuse me. So again, speaker. The authority the person has, this is where uh, that kind of connects to, again, the idea of the position or job or the title they have. What sort of authority do they have in society? Their character. Um, again, that ties to reputation. What you think about the quality of their character, right? That's also part of it, the quality of their character. Um, <clears throat> are they somebody respectable, right? Are they somebody that has a lot of achievements, okay? Have they achieved a lot in their life? Again, that's that whole idea of experience. Do they have things that have proven they are uh, legitimate, right? Legitimate. So here again, the whole idea of their authority, all this wrapped up achievement, reputation, experience, are you going to accept and trust them? Okay? When they tell you to do something, they give you this message, they give you a mission in life, they're trying to change things. Are you going to trust that message and accept it? Right. This goes back to that uh, example I gave of Instagram influencers. Right. Are you going to, first off, are you going to follow them? Right? Are they going to show up in your feed and then when they post something that is actually an advertisement but then maybe doesn't act, pretend it's an advertisement but actually is an advertisement, are you going to buy whatever stupid product they're pushing? Okay, They're trying to influence. Okay? Do they influence you if you trust them and accept the message? And again, this gets back to what we um, discussed with the, the songs that we started off with. Okay? The songs that we started off with 
uh, I used as examples, okay? That little spot is just stuck there, okay? Who they say changes the meaning of what is said, right? We interpret it differently. We uh, absorb it or digest it, however you want to say it. We take it differently depending on who says it to us, okay? This is all just kind of, there we go. Okay, I'm going to have to turn that off. There we go. So again, the idea is putting on the hat completely changes who the person is. It's not just a platypus. It's Perry the platypus. Sorry, that was my horrible doofus impression. I've been practicing. I don't think it went off very well. I'm just going to keep going. Perry's not just a platypus, right? He's something special, right? He's something more. You add the hat. And again, he's no ordinary platypus, okay? So as the audience... How you perceive them, how you view the person, affects what you see them as, right? <clears throat> and again, going back to my fire analogy, okay, the speaker is sort of like the fuel in the fire. You change the fuel in the fire, so whether you're burning potassium, here, my screen is over here, uh, potassium, copper, that says cesium, boron, calcium, whatever is burning, it changes the whole nature of the fire. Right? And again, same with ethos. In a rhetorical situation, who the ethos is, who the person is, the ethos they have, the perception, changes the whole nature of that relationship with the audience. Okay? And so again, thinking about pathos, excuse me, <clears throat> pathos. That is again, that connection to the audience, how the audience reacts, right? The reaction they have based on what the speaker says. So using the emotional response of the audience, using the emotional response of the audience. So it can come from, again, what, I'm, what the speaker says to the audience and then how they react to it. It also can come from how the speaker uh, themselves act upon the stage, right? If the speaker shows some sort of emotion, that can then uh, cause the audience to share that same emotion. Okay? So that's where pathos is a little, uh, has a lot of different layers, where if you're thinking of, the speaker, um, the emotion of the speaker, but then also the emotion of the audience. And again, you're thinking of a whole range of emotions, okay? More than just the basic happy, sad, angry, afraid, okay? You could think of the emotion of, <clears throat> of pride, right? The emotion of hope. Um, those can also be uh, pathos uh, strategies, right? Goals for the audience in order to push them to whatever the objective is, to make them feel hope, um, to make them feel inspired, uh, not just angry and afraid, okay? <clears throat> the thinking also could be how uh, the emotion can help you belong to a certain group, okay? So this is where ethos and pathos can kind of all be wrapped up in pushing you to belong to some sort of group feeling, okay? So if um, you talk about... A, an appeal to something, okay? So a type of pathos, again, this is a type of uh, rhetorical strategy using pathos, is an appeal to patriotism, right? Your feeling of patriotism, your feeling of patriotism, patriotism is going to motivate you to act a certain way, okay? Or an appeal to tradition, right? Tradition or maybe your heritage, your history. Well, again, it could be your nation's history, a cultural history, uh, <clears throat> community's history, an appeal to family, saying this is our family, this is how who we are, and so this is why you need to act a certain way, right? You have a responsibility. Say to your family, uh, or your family is trying to persuade you, say to their child, they'd be, you would be the first in the family to go to college. You have a responsibility to your family, right? So appealing to their sense of family, belonging to the family could motivate and push them to achieve something, to act a certain way. Or again, lastly, appealing to religion. This again goes back to that sense and feeling of belonging, belonging, right? Being part of a group appeals to patriotism, tradition, family, religion. Those are all connected to, let's see, pathos, right? This idea of how, as the audience member, how I'm thinking and reacting. <clears throat> lastly, logos. Okay, this is more of the... Um, <clears throat> non-emotional, right? Not thinking of the group I belong to, but again, more of the ideas the audience is want, wanting you to, 
or the speaker is wanting you to consider. Um, how you are thinking, right? This thought process you have using facts, statistics, data, survey, information, and details, right? And this is again where it gets tricky because there can be false logic, right? And this is where we get problems with things like flat earthers, right? They think they're being scientific, right? They are trying to act like they're giving you all this logic and reasons, <clears throat> but it's not going far enough because they stop at, you are in this group, and we're not actually questioning the bigger idea of what are those facts and those logics, or excuse me, logical details, right? So again, logos is more of the message in the actual words of what's being said, not necessarily who the person is speaking to them or how the audience is reacting, okay? So all these get mixed together, right? All these get mixed together in that rhetorical relationship, okay? So you have, <clears throat> again, you have the speaker and the audience and the message, okay? And those are all interacting together in the moment of the speech, <clears throat> interacting together in the moment of the speech, who the speaker is, what they're saying, and the audience, okay? So again, we have this movement from the speaker, the message, to the audience. And this is where, again, where the magic happens, okay? The thing to consider is what happens after, okay? What about after? And this, again, I'll, I'll come back to in a minute in my video. But the whole process of relationship is sort of like this timeline where I'm a speaker who I am, okay? I have a message and it's given to the audience. And this relationship between uh, all three that kind of goes around in a circle. Because I did, as an audience, I give authority to the speaker based on my perception, okay, who I view them to be. And then as a speaker, I have a certain reaction to the audience, which again influences how they interpret or believe what I'm trying to say. All right, I have some examples. I have some examples that I want to give for these concepts that I'm talking about. Okay, these may seem kind of silly, okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, being the nice and decent parent that I am, I allowed my kids to eat a Lunchable. I know, I know what you're saying. How could I do that? It's barely food, but I didn't want to be a mean parent. I was trying to, you know, just relax. And I noticed on this Lunchable, that came with these little cute cartoons, right? These cute little cartoons. Um, <clears throat> and it's all about Lunchables, right? So the first panel, we have this platypus. Again, with the platypus, notice he, if we put a little hat on him, we'd be like, Perry the platypus? Platypus in a jackalope talking about Lunchables, okay? Notice what they say. It's this cute little cartoon. Uh, jackalopes, hey, 100% or Lunchables with 100% juice over that wall. And platypus, of course, is like, boom. And then, oh, how funny, right? Irony, he doesn't go over the wall, he goes through the wall. Ha ha, ha ha. Apparently it's supposed to be funny, unexpected. And then the jackalope says, or through the wall. Great job. Right? I need, I just need a minute. Okay, is there something else going on here? Right? Notice the very little details. Again, this is kind of just a little throwaway cartoon. It's literally a throwaway cartoon. It's the wrapper that is on the packaging that you take off. But again, the company put money, right? Money plus effort. <clears throat> they put money and effort into have someone uh, come up with this little five panel story. Okay? They had an animator. They had <clears throat> somebody to create these little characters, right? There's multiple of these little rappers and cartoons on the Lunchables, right? So as throwaway as it might seem, there is at least effort. And why would they put effort into this if they didn't think it would have some sort of outcome, right? So again, if we're thinking about on the surface, it's just a throwaway wrapper, okay? Throwaway wrapper. Throw away wrapper, I can spell, right? But if we're going to be this critical thinker, this cute little ship, what is in the iceberg, okay? What's in the iceberg? We notice some details right? Why do they go out of their way to point out that it's 100% juice, okay? What is sort of the mentality behind that, right? They want you to think because that is the mentality nowadays, we have to have it healthy, okay? It's not just juice, it's 100% juice, right? That way it's more healthy. It's not all this 
evil sugar with everything, right? It's healthy. So it's comforting to parents, right? So if we think of the audience, maybe, I've, once again, do you think kids are taking the time to be like, oh my gosh, it's 100% juice. I totally will drink this Capri Sun. No, this is more the audience of the parents, right? Just kind of reinforce that idea that Lunchable is healthy. It's something you give to your kid. It's okay for them to eat, right? And then again, <clears throat> why would a platypus put himself in a cannon? Because those Lunchables are so desirable, right? It's very subtle. It's beneath the surface, okay? They're desirable <clears throat> and healthy. We want these, okay? Very simple, okay? And they have another one. Um, <clears throat> now, this is where I noticed it, right? Because the more that you see it, you see this kind of repetition, right? So this is another one. Uh, again, the platypus and the jackalope, they're going to do um, tetherball, right? That's the game. Who plays that anymore? So winner gets 100% juice. So notice we see the repetition here. We're starting to notice a pattern, okay? Starting to notice a pattern. Clearly, again, this is something that they are putting money to, that they are doing intentionally, pointing out that it is 100% juice because they want that idea of healthy, healthy. Of course, we are remembering that 100% juice just still means it's 100% sugar, just maybe not artificial. Okay, So um, <clears throat> they're going to play tetherball. Uh, winner gets a lunch ball with 100% juice. And again, we're see. He's not just playing, he's just going for it, right? He's putting in a little extra. Look how badly the platypus wanted that Lunchable. How important is that? So again, just to emphasize, what did I say before? The, how desirable it was, right? Emphasize, emphasize how important or desirable the Lunchable is, okay? Again, very simple. This one only has four panels, right? Only a four panel cartoon. But again, there is money plus effort, okay? There's money plus effort to develop what we think is a cartoon, but is actually an advertisement for Lunchables to reinforce that it's healthy, okay? And how important it is. Even though it's just some throwaway wrapper, they need to continue and perpetuate that idea. <clears throat> What you got to keep in mind, okay, is that Kraft, the company that makes it, okay, they don't actually care how healthy the food is, right? They just want you to think that the juice is healthy, okay? They just want to emphasize that it's something that it's important that you should care about. Should you actually drink the juice? No, you should not, right? Of course, if you're a normal human being in the course of your life, you're probably going to drink juice at some point. But is it something that is as important for them to emphasize here. No, but again, they're trying to trick us into not realizing the garbage that it is. They're trying to make us look away from, <clears throat> I'll go back to my McDonald's example, if I can have it. Again, the idea of if we're really just thinking about how bad something is, we would never eat it or drink it or consume it. But we need, they need to be able to trick us with with these little rhetorical, simple, very subtle rhetorical strategies. Okay. And again, this is the, the whole basic basis of advertisements, right? So I'm going to go through example number two. Example number two. Say you work for an advertising agency, right? You have a company, <clears throat> your sole job is to sell a product, right? To create a commercial that then makes someone buy it, okay? How would you spell sell spaghetti sauce, right? Spaghetti sauce, it's just tomatoes and maybe a few seasonings in a jar. Uh, it's ridiculous how many different brands of spaghetti sauce there are because it's you would think it would almost be pretty standard, right? But then, of course, every company wants to have their own. So how do you advertise it, right? If I'm thinking of here in 2020, if I'm going to sell to people, um, what would your advertisement say, right? You obviously just would not have an empty bottle, right? You would, or an empty jar. You would have to put something on the label, right? And then again, if you're making a commercial, you would have to think about 
would it would it have music? What would there be some sort of action? Would you have some sort of characters? What would it say? Okay. And again, if we go back to our rhetorical situation, ba, 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 let's see. This, this rhetorical situation. What the speaker is, right, the message that they say depends on who the audience is, okay? So if I'm Spaghetti Company, right, I have to think about who my audience is as I create the message, right? That's why all these things, this all this speaker, message, audience are kind of wrapped up into each other. Because <clears throat> if it's, say, an audience from the 1950s, okay, or the 1960s versus 2020, or even audience of 1980, right, 70s, 80s. I don't know, I'm just scribbling a bunch of decades. I don't know why. <clears throat> the idea is maybe a different audience has a different uh, value system, right? So again, if my audience, if I have this different value system, I'm going to put different things in the ad, okay? The value system of the audience. What is important? What are they looking for in an ad? Okay, and what do they want in an ad? Let's see. We're going to find out. New Perego Farmer's Market with tomatoes picked at the peak of freshness. It's ridiculous. I know. That advertisement is it's short, <clears throat> but I, I use it because hopefully it's very obvious how intentionally chosen every single detail is, right? of this, this uh, Prego's Farmer's Market spaghetti sauce. Okay, again, it's just spaghetti sauce. But you have to always think about how much uh, decision-making went into the ad, right? So you always have to keep in mind that in every advertisement, everything that get, gets created, whether it's a, a political speech, um, an advertisement, an essay about whatever topic, okay, <clears throat> there is somebody sitting, planning it out, strategizing what is going to go into it, okay? So when you think about an advertisement, if we think about this commercial, okay, think about the people behind it. There's a group of people sitting in a room somewhere that are thinking about how to control you, right? What strings to pull in your brain to make you their little puppet, right? To make you react a certain way. So whenever we read through anything or analyze it, always kind of have this separation, this distance, between what you're reading and keep in mind that there was a person in a room somewhere planning how to affect you, how to change you, right? So for the different aspects of this ad, right? <clears throat> and you can always stop this video and go back and rewatch it, rewatch it as many times as you need. Um, but remember the sound of it, right? We have this acapella pentatonic type singing, okay? This music, it's light, it's happy. Very intentional, right? That's kind of helps set the mood, create the pathos, right? The sound of it kind of helps establish this mood of the audience. Again, this visual, fresh food, bright, clean kitchen, okay? <clears throat> and again, if we think of the story that it goes through, picking ingredients and then showing actually creating the sauce and then serving it to somebody. And as we notice at the very end, the product, right? It shows us the product at the very end. Notice how the jars open. Notice how some of it's already been used, right? Because people are eating it. But again, what do they put in the label? Farmer's market, right? And what do people love nowadays more than ever? Of course, I'm looking outside. It's all smoky, right? So we don't really have farmer's market at this second in time. But sort of this attitude of the culture here in 2020 loves farmers' markets, right? We love farmers' markets. So they know, they strategize that if they put that on their label, be like, oh, look how healthy this is. Look, this is good. This is just the same as if I went out to my local farmers' market and got all the ingredients myself, okay? <clears throat> Classic marinara, right? Very simple, right? A very simple, plain label, 
Okay? Again, all of that is intentional. There was somebody that sat in a room, maybe a group of people, time, effort, money, all of those. Time plus effort. This is why there's something there to analyze. I'm not just making it up. Because Prego spent the time, to, maybe they hired somebody, maybe they have their own in-house advertising company, whatever, to design this label. Okay? Notice the cute little chicken, right? The cute little chicken up on the top, again, sort of establishing that <clears throat> maybe more rural, uh, country, farmer, farmer's market mentality. Um, and again, that wonderful slogan with some alliteration, tomatoes picked at the peak of freshness. What a great story this tells, right? And if you remember, you pay attention to the, if you go back and rewatch the, the commercial, the words that they say, pick, squish, crush, press, chop, stir, all very <clears throat> simple actions, but that relate to the process of you making your own dinner, right? Again, the process of, this is not store-bought, right? This is homemade with ingredients from a farmer's market. Right? So again, we're trying to establish, again, if we're thinking of this ethos, okay, the, and again, it may sound like it's just spaghetti, but this is their ethos, right? I am natural. I am as homemade as you can get. I'm as close to what the farmer's market is that you might see, okay? Pick, squish, crush, press, chop, stir. It's kind of like laying out a recipe, right? This is the process we go through. <clears throat> The stuff that's actually in the jar, do you think it went through any of this handmade, handmade by one person, served up to one family for dinner? No, not at all, right? It's made in the factory, just like everything else. But they want to hide that, right? Because they want to create that ethos of uh, homemade farmer's market quality because that makes people happy. That makes me feel good, right? I have the reaction that I love it and it feels good. So again, if we're thinking, <clears throat> Prego, this giant company, right, wants you to see them a certain way. There's somebody that's homemade. They're as good as grandma would make, right? So then this is the reputation they want, right? This is the reputation they want. They have a certain emotional attachment they want to have to the product for you, okay? It feels comforting. It feels homemade. Uh, it just feels like it's something natural that would, we would make on our own. Okay, that's my... Again, uh, maybe comforting, okay? And then maybe kind of like relieved that I'm eating something kind of healthy, okay? So I don't have to worry about it being uh, unhealthy. And then again, the idea of logos, okay? The argument they're making, the idea literally comes to this is what they do. This is their message. We pick it, we squish it, we crush it, we press it, we chop it, we stir, and you eat it, and he's over there, this guy, he eats it, and he loves it. Okay, this is their argument. We make uh, real food with real recipes, real homemade, even though it's in a factory. Okay, that is the argument that they're making. All of this wrapped up in this one commercial, okay, where they're trying to incorporate ethos of their identity and your reaction as the audience and the argument about the quality of their product. Again, because they want your money. When you stand in the grocery store, notice this next time if you ever go to the grocery store, just look at any aisle and just see how many different brands and types of a single product there is. If you look at the, all the different spaghetti sauces, right, there could be dozens of different spaghetti sauces, different types, different companies, right? You maybe have the generic store brand, you maybe have all the different types, Prego, Regu, whatever, all trying to sound like there's some sort of natural Italian company. And so why would we pick this one? Okay, Why would we pick this one? Out of all the ones on the shelf, they're trying to push for this one. Okay, So this is what we're trying to keep in mind, right? Whether it's um, spaghetti sauce, whether it's some dumb little Lunchable, or whether it is Kanye West. I'm trying to get back to that. Kanye West's t-shirt, right? There is a, a relationship being developed between the speaker, right? I'm down here. Between the speaker, the emotion of the audience, and the, um, the message being given. Okay, I'm going to go back to my other one here. 
Okay, so again, this relationship being developed, and it changes depending on the situation, okay? Depending on the product, some products will, you know, if we're thinking of food companies or other, any company, some might use ethos more than another, right? And so this is part of the trick of our analysis, right? Some companies use ethos more. Some companies require more heavily on emotion, and I'll, I'll show examples of this. Some are all about, like, the facts and the message, okay? Generally, with commercials, you're going to find they rely more heavily on emotion, okay? Um, and this is kind of the way it turns. It's more of, like, trying to be funny or silly, okay? But, again, they're all different. And as we move away from just watching commercials and actually reading, um, analyzing much more difficult, complex things in class, you're going to have to be ready for, are you looking more for ethos, more for pathos, more for logos? How is each text that you read different? And that's really the critical thinking that you have to do. Because um, not everything is going to rely on ethos or logos or pathos, but it might be one more than the other. And so this is where we get into adding depth to our analysis. Okay, As we go uh, start from just looking at simple things like ethos, pathos, and logos, this is where we start to add some more depth to our analysis. Okay, depth to our analysis. As we get more complicated, right, as we get more complicated in our analysis <clears throat> and looking at different ideas, all right, there are more words that we're going to be able to incorporate and connect to as we analyze, right? So things like diction, imagery, syntax, tone that aren't necessarily ethos and pathos and logos on their own, but are something that help work towards uh, an emotional response, establishing identity, getting across a message, okay? So these are all the words we're going to slowly start to incorporate into our, our analysis as we try to figure out uh, what is the rhetorical situation in whatever we read. Okay, so hyperbole, irony, allusion, analogy, juxtaposition, appeals. These are just a few that we are going to slowly work on. Um, I'll be giving you a vocabulary list for you to continually refer back to and try to study and hopefully get more comfortable connecting how these are used. They're not, again, just like with ethos, pathos, and logos. Let me go back to my slide with weird triangles, okay? <clears throat> just like these three are all used differently each time, not all these are going to be used all the time, okay? Okay, a couple other things to keep in mind as we, and I'm just trying to lay out a preview, a simple introduction for what we're working towards. Um, <clears throat> as we think about purpose, okay, as we think about the purpose of what we read, that is really the, the end goal, the, the sort of the focal point of our discussion, trying to understand the author's purpose. One thing we need to keep in mind is uh, stop saying talks about, right? And I'm going to harp on this over and over again, over and over again. It's a habit that we need to break saying talks about. The author talks about, or he talks about, or um, somebody talks about. Habit we're going to break, okay? The other habit we need to break <clears throat> excuse me, those simple uh, purpose uh, <clears throat> concepts that were established in either elementary school or middle school, right? The idea that a purpose is to make it stick in your head. That's not a purpose, right? So he uses humor to make it stick in the audience's head or to make him think about it. As we work towards um, <clears throat> more in-depth analysis, we're going to really understand that there's another level we need to push to. Okay, more than just making it stick in our head, <clears throat> push our analysis to something more. Okay? So as we do that, as we think about the biggest thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about a rhetorical purpose is how there's this chronological sequence that we need to think about when we analyze anything. Okay? I kind of mentioned that before with thinking about the advertising agency, right? the advertising agency that comes up with a commercial. Okay? There are people that sat in the room and then they made the commercial, and then you watched the commercial, okay? So again, the secret, and then you went to the store, and clearly you bought this uh, spaghetti sauce because farmer's market, it's got chicken on it, why not, right? It's that chronology of analysis and what the purpose is, okay? We usually think about only the rhetorical analysis that happens in the text as we read it or in the speech as we listen to it, and that's it, okay? But as we get into more in-depth analysis, we notice there's this chronological sequence, 
right? This time, chronology, sequence of events. We have to keep in mind, here's the fancy word that we need to learn, exigence, the exigence. What caused the person to speak, right? What caused the person to create this text or create the essay that we are then uh, reading and anal analyzing in class? Was it some social issue, right, that happened? Was there some tra tragic event that happened that caused them to speak? Okay, so if we're trying to understand the analysis, it's this exigence, again, fancy word exigence, that we need to try to identify. Okay, then the next step is what is happening during the passage, okay? What has happened during the passage? Um, <clears throat> and this is where we see rhetorical devices, rhetorical strategies, and we look at the interaction between that speaker and the audience and the message that I mentioned earlier, that relationship that gets built. But it doesn't stop there, okay? The last part of the analysis is what happens after, okay? What happens after the speech? And that is really what the purpose is, okay? What comes after? So you sit here, you listen to the speech, or you read this essay, or you see this commercial. The goal isn't that just you laugh at the dumb dog in the commercial. The goal is that you then go out and buy the Doritos, okay? Or the goal isn't that you just, you know, listen to this catchy little song. You see this dude with the eyebrows loving that spaghetti sauce. The goal is that you then go do something. <clears throat> and that's really what where rhetorical purpose comes in. And in a full analysis, really a full discussion of everything that happens in class, that's the last thing that you need to be able to connect to and identify, okay? What caused the person to speak and create whatever it is you're, you're analyzing? What was the exigence? What happened in the passage, okay? What are the rhetorical devices or rhetorical strategies? And then what is the outcome, what happens after, okay? What is the ultimate purpose? It could be some sort of action on behalf of the audience or some kind of change that they want to happen in the world, how they want to change things that are going on around them, okay? So as you're thinking about it, as we go keep going through it, I'm going to try to give you different um, like graphic organizers and handouts um, that we will try to incorporate into what we're doing, okay? We're going to save these last ideas for, I think, next time, next time, again, the most basic ideas, let's get back to this one page, the most basic idea of what we're thinking about, right? Because we're trying to understand how we have ethos, okay? We have ethos, logos, and pathos. Again, those are the most fundamental elements of everything that we look at and try to understand, okay? That we are not just looking at one thing. Let me go back to my other analogy, I know where it is. It's right here, okay? We're not just looking at a thing. We're trying to think about what are the different parts and what is the reality of what's actually going on in anything that we look at, okay? Again, this is all introduction, okay? This is gonna be a lot of practice that we keep coming back to, and I'm making these videos so it's something you can review, because I always talk too fast, I know that. Um, <clears throat> but just remember, these are the basic concepts cute little poster. We like it. Thank you. Uh, I think that's good for today. That's enough video. We've seen enough. Uh, there'll be more next week. As always, let me know if you have questions. Okay? Thanks. Betty the platypus. Betty the platypus. A banjo playing platypus. Betty the banjo playing platypus. Dr. Wexler, you're a platypus. <gasps> Hey, what was all that about? Patty the platypus! <gasps> Patty the platypus! Wait, who are you? A platypus? Patty the platypus! What kind of a plumber are you? A platypus plumber? Patty the platypus plumber? Patty the platypus! Bugger the bonga guan! What is this, some kind of Latin gorilla cha-cha-gram? Hola! I can rumba parry the cha-cha-gram! And what are you supposed to be, a kid in a sheet? A platypus in a sheet? Parry the platypus in a sheet? A teenage girl? Parry 
Hey, the teenage girl! <sighs> the mysterious platypus from the casino. Hey, the mysterious platypus from the casino.